We're live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March edition of the MURSD Leads Author Interview Series. Uh, snow and power outages across our area uh, knocked out our initial date, uh, but thankfully, uh, Scott was kind enough to reschedule, and we're, we're glad to have the co-author of Different Schools for a Different, Word, doc, for a Different World, Dr. Scott McLeod. Uh, Scott is an associate professor of educational leadership at the University of Colorado, Denver, and is also one of the leading experts on school leadership in the digital era. He's the uh, founder of both the annual Iowa One-to-One -One Institute at EdCamp Iowa. He's also received the two, 2016 award for outstanding leadership. Missy, I think you are our second uh, outstanding leadership award winner on this series. So good trend. Uh, and nationally, I feel like Scott has pre presented at just, or, or keynoted at just about every EdTech conference in the country. Uh, on, a, on a very personal note, uh, Scott has been extraordinarily helpful uh, for me and members of our district, helping to support our modern learning initiatives and to make ideas actionable. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here tonight. It's a delight, thanks. Uh, joining me on the panel tonight are some familiar faces and a fantastic new addition. From the Menden Upton Regional School District, we have Assistant Superintendent Dr. Maureen Cohen and the Grade 8 World Experience teacher, Jimmy Charest. Maureen, Jimmy, welcome. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. <laughs> With enthusiasm. Our new panelist is uh, Beth Holland, a doctoral candidate at uh, the Johns Hopkins University and a columnist for EdWeek and EdUtopia on all things ed tech and ed leadership. She also travels the country giving presentations and workshops, including uh, the keynote at the May 10th Inspired Learning Convention here at Nipmuc Regional High School. Beth, so glad you could join us. Thanks for keynoting and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, Scott, so I'm gonna lead it off tonight. Um, our district has been exploring the idea of inspired learning or learning opportunities that have made a lasting impact on people. Uh, I'm curious, what, what is your most memorable learning experience, either as a student in, in your K-12 experience or uh, during your, your teaching career? Scott, I think you cut out there for a second. I didn't hear your response. Still nothing. No dice. Nope. All right, trying again. Is that work? All right, there we go. All right, so I can't pick a failing calculus my freshman year of college. Of course you can. Yeah, so what did you learn from it? Uh, yeah, well, I learned that uh, I better start buckling up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, I think it's interesting to me when I think about my time as a K-12 student, um, there's not much that really sticks out to me as, as being inspiring. I remember some uninspiring moments, which I think is kind of sad because those stuck with me. Um, but uh, yeah, nothing's really grabbing me. I think uh, if I had to pick anything, it would probably be my uh, 12th grade um, field trip we took to Wallops Island um, in Virginia where the AP bio and AP chemistry students went together and we did like three days of hands-on work um, you know uh, in this old um, army uh, military base that had been converted into a scientific research facility right and so we went out and did a lot of hands-on scientific experiments with our teachers and so on and, you know that's probably it maybe just because of the hands-on component so to kind of follow up there quickly there scott so would you say that the lack of having any sort of inspiring learning experiences shaped the type of work that you're doing because when, when i've seen you present um what I really appreciate is that you have tangible examples of the, the amazing things that students are doing. Has that disconnect between in-school and out-of-school learning really shaped what you're trying to advocate to do? Yeah, probably, because I remember being really bored as a student most of the time. So, and just wishing that, you know, the clock would tick faster. So, and I think that's probably a pretty common experience. So, yeah, so as I strive to do work with schools, I'm aiming for something better than that. Thanks. And as we're thinking about like changing the experiences of schools, uh, in your book and in our district, 
Uh, we've been discussing the four big shifts that schools need to make when redesigning uh, those experiences for kids. Um, for those of um, for those who are not familiar with the shifts and what they are, um, could you please like describe them and then also talk about which of those shifts might be um, most accessible on ramps for making schools different? Sure. So the first shift is really shifting from. Uh, an overwhelming emphasis on factual recall and procedural regurgitation to uh, what we might call deeper learning. You know, activities that require greater, co greater cognitive complexity and challenge our kids to do more with their brains. So critical thinking, problem solving, powerful communication collaboration opportunities, the chance to be creative, um, you know, global intercultural awareness, stuff like that, the stuff that's on the higher end of Bloom's taxonomy or further around on the web's depth of knowledge wheel is usually what we talk about when we talk about those higher level or deeper level learning experiences. Uh, Richard Elmore at Harvard has, and many others, <laughs> to be honest, um, uh, have gone in and coded what we see in kids' day-to-day -day work at all levels of the system, K through 12. And whether it's Elmore or Richard Pianta at Harvard or um, you know, countless, I'm sorry, Richard Pianta at University of Virginia or countless others, what they see is just you know, across tens of thousands of classrooms and multiple decades of work is that something around 80 to 85% of kids' day-to-day -day work is low level recall. Um, and of course, now we can look up that stuff on our phone in just a few seconds. So that's shift one, is that, I don't know what the right balance is, but we definitely need more um, deeper learning work than before. Second shift is really around agency. You know, we have school districts everywhere whose mission statement says something along the lines of blah, 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 lifelong learning, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, there's a implied in that statement that you're self-directing your own learning, right? That you're driving your own learning throughout your life and figuring out how to stay informed and skill up and be adaptive and so on. And yet, if we look at the day-to-day -day experiences of most students, we really tell them what to do almost every minute of every day up until they graduate in most places. So they never really get an opportunity to be self-directed learners, which means they never really get a chance to see what that means while they have adults around them for guidance. And then all of a sudden we thrust them into this complex world and complex information landscapes like, go be a lifelong learner, even though you've never had the chance to do it yourself, except at home. Um, and so we're missing out there. So that's shift number two. Shift three is around authentic work. Um, I think most classrooms are pretty siloed and isolated from the real world around them. So we see a lot of students asking questions like, why do I care about this? Why do I need to know this? What meaning or relevance does this have to my life? Um, and But when we connect kids with real world authentic learning opportunities and, and tasks, uh, local communities, online communities, global communities, um, they ask those questions far uh, less often because they start to see the connections between what we're asking them to do and how the world works around them. Um, and then fi final shift is really the shift from analog to digital. It's this idea that you know we live in a digital information landscape these days. One of the school's primary jobs is to prepare kids for the dominant information landscape of their time. Um, so it's important in and of itself. But it's also powerful because when we get powerful technologies and online environments into the hands of students, they can do those first three shifts in more amazing and meaningful ways. So you can be a deeper learner often, you can have greater agency and personalize your experience, you can do more authentic work when you have powerful tools in your hands that otherwise they don't have. And actually, uh, you know, you asked Jimmy what the most accessible on-ramp is, and I see a lot of schools jumping on that bandwagon first. So, and I call it a bandwagon because um, the technology seems to be the easiest part of those four. So, you know, for all the complexities of investing in one-to-one -one initiatives and bandwidth upgrades, in the grand scheme of things, that tends to be easier than changing your learning and teaching culture, which is what the other three require. Thank you. Um, hey, Gut, like on that idea of changing the learning and teaching culture, and when it's that question of how do we start to think about what are the behaviors and the beliefs that we're looking to instill both in our students as well as our faculty, what what are some, have you found any really successful entry points and how to bring more people into that conversation? Because where, you know, I always appreciate the fact that, that we can have these conversations and now how do we bring more people in when there's that predominant feeling of like, well, I have, you know, these mandates or these policies or these test scores. And 
I'm putting you on the spot as well, since I know that, you know, coming from Iowa with the work that you like the state has done, looking at the idea of like authentic intellectual work, you know, how do we really start to base like even with that experience, you know, how do you bring more people into this conversation and get them to start thinking about the behaviors and the beliefs and not just the technology? Right. So, you know, Simon Sinek always talks about the why, right? You have to start with the why. And so I think the ve- before we start talking about the how and the what, uh, we have to always go back to the why. And, um, you know, I think we have to create cognitive and emotional dissonance with our educators and our parents and our community members, you know, and so I think we have to really help them see that, you know, our world is changing quite rapidly, change, schools change quite rapidly. That means the relevance gap between those two continue to increase. And so how do we help people recognize what does it really mean to prepare a future ready graduate these days? You know, somebody who's going to graduate in the next year to 15 years, right? And we'll be ready for what the world is going to ask of them because it's changing so quickly. Um, So, you know, our friend Will Richardson always talks about the fact that probably the number one skill we can give our graduates is the ability to be adaptive. And I think that's probably right. And you sure don't gain that skill in just tell me what to do in environments where you're just spitting back the right answer, quote unquote. Um, so I think we have to create those kind of moments of conversation and discussion where people feel very uncertain and, and experience that emotional and cognitive dissonance. And then we start talking about how do we close the gap between where we are now and where we need to be, right? Um, and start to reconcile some of that distance, dissonance with the what and the how, if that makes sense. Can I, sorry, one more. Um, one of the things too is what happens when there isn't that recognition of the gap and there's still that like, you know, this was what I know to be school and therefore that must be what school is. So, I mean, sometimes I'm wondering, it's like, how do you, or what the question would phrase to me is who's decided that we need to make the shift. So what happens if they're, how do we bring the people in that maybe haven't seen that yet? Right. So, I mean, we do know that if you don't see any need to change, you're not going to. So, I mean, you can't will somebody to believe differently about something. All you can do is keep putting examples in front of them of uh, disconnects and dissonance and hope that they eventually take it on. Now, as school leaders, we can ask ourselves whether or not we want those people on staff. That's a different question, right? But ultimately, there's a certain set of people that um, are either going to recognize that we now live in a global innovation society and that our schools really aren't designed for that, which means we have to adapt, or they're going to try and tough it out until retirement or until somebody fires them or whatever, right? Um, and then we as school leaders have to decide if that's okay. So, But again, we can't make somebody change their belief system. All we can decide is ultimately do they stay in the system. The, the piece, and so I have a follow-up question um, that kind of relates to this because I love this sense of, um, you know, how do you bring about that change and is it, I think we're seeing a moment of these external forces that are really creating that dissonance. Um, But what really struck me in one part of your book was when you were going through the, and I had read all these before, but it reminded me, you know, I'm like, oh, he's so right. We have all the history references. So you had Dewey and then Postman and Weingartner, and then you had the Nation at Risk and then um, Schmoker Study. And you talked about how, um, you know, what we're asking students to do have been you know, trivial or they've been uninspired. And what I liked that you mentioned as you described it as a structural problem. Um, and I think that's a piece that I'm struggling with, especially in my role currently as a, I felt like I had a little more control as a building level um, leader in leading some of the change. But um, when you're at the central office and as an assistant superintendent here, we're like, okay, we see these big structural problems. I, I liked viewing it that way. Um, I think some of the changes we've been doing have been trying to work through teachers and small, some have been big, but have you seen or do you have any suggested step strategies of how to address this structural problem um, that we're facing in all of our school districts of, of moving this change? Uh, yeah, so there's sort of sort of have three paths, I guess. Path one is start a school from scratch. Yeah. Right. That, that's always, that's always a, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> that's always a nice path. Yeah. 
Second path is give up, get out of education. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> um, third path is really what can we do within our existing systems? And the way you start is you start with small scale pilots and experiments, mm -hmm. right? And you plant some seeds and you grow them. There is no other way to do it. You're not going to upend your traditional long standing school or school district tomorrow and do something new, right? So then you've got to figure out what is that group of kids and group of educators um, that you can do something different with that's a seed that you can plant. And maybe you have multiple seeds, right? Maybe you're trying um, idea A over here with this batch of kids and these students, I'm sorry, and these teachers, and you have idea B, which you're trying over here with this batch of students and these teachers, right? And maybe you've got C and D, whatever, right? Whatever ideas you want to plant. And they might be big and they might be small. They might be everything from let's uh, tweak that unit we're doing next week for a couple days and see how it works, all the way up to let's create a school within a school or an academy for these struggling ninth graders or whatever, right? That's great. And I think we're we're doing that in our district. I mean, it's, it's definitely the planting seeds and information and across all stakeholders. I guess I keep thinking like, what am I missing? You know, maybe I'm not missing it, but what am I missing of something larger or bigger that some people have successfully done that I maybe am not aware of um, to have even bigger shifts? So, I don't think there's a magic silver bullet here. I think, you know, this is complex redesign work. I do think that a lot of districts could accelerate their work by engaging in a couple of key activities, one of which is um, massive amounts of over communication and publicity about the successes of the new initiative. We don't publicize enough. We don't brag enough. We don't share enough. Um, and so people don't know how to think about those new movements um, in the because they're familiar with or traditional ways of doing, and they don't, they're not being sold on the new um, path, sold, right, um, and are informed. So that's number one. And then number two is, I see a lot of districts that implement pilots, but they haven't thought about what a long-term scaling strategy is that would expand that by some amount each year for the next three to five years. And so maybe you have that in your district, maybe you don't, but if you don't, as you see seeds of promise, What's your plan to scale those? You should probably ought to be talking about that. I think I think we're lucky because we're a smaller district, so it's e it's easier to scale things here um, than it would be in some larger districts, as I would guess. All right, thank you so much. And I mean, I guess to to follow on to all of that, um, and this is fun because Dave and I have had this debate back and forth for months now, and and it's the battle of like. When do you make the wide sweeping change and when do you work incrementally? And, you know, I know from, from talking to you and in your book and you talk a lot about how, you know, we need to make this significant shift in practice, but then it's, you know, there's this incremental change to get there. So how do we, and like you said too, maybe there's a pilot, maybe there's something bigger. So how do we find the balance between like getting caught in the incremental or making the big improvement? you can't move faster than your people are ready for, right? So if your people aren't ready to move as fast as you are, you know, they can't just all of a sudden leap to a new place. You've got to bring them along. And that's usually a time intensive process. So, you know, if you've got a school staff that's mostly ready to go, then you can make a bigger shift. If you've got a staff that's all over the place, right, or a parent community that's a little hesitant, you've got to move slower. And, if, you know, that's all very contextual. Of course, so you have to read the pulse of your community and figure out just how fast can you move. Um, and maybe that's a three-year process, and maybe that's a 15-year process, in which case I hope you get to keep your leadership long enough to sustain it. So, so to follow up there, uh, Scott, <clears throat> um, I, I've been thinking one of the, the uh, items that jumped out to me in the book, and I don't think it's talked about enough, is uh, the tall poppy syndrome. Can you talk a little bit about that and then I've got a kind of a follow-up question. So how would you describe the tall poppy syndrome in, in schools and other organizations? Sure, so we can call it the tall poppy syndrome or the crab bucket syndrome, but the idea is that you know people who start to stand out get lopped off, right? So in Australia, they call it the tall poppy syndrome because if you grow too tall, you know, you lop your head off. Um, if the crab bucket metaphor, it's this idea that any crab that tries to escape, 
or do something different or, or go off in a new direction gets pulled down by the other crabs, right? And I think, unfortunately, we got a lot of school cultures where um, our fellow educators are more than willing to take our innovators and, and do whatever it takes to rein them back in for whatever reason, either because um, fear issues or control issues or concerns that they're being made to look bad or you're upsetting our norms here or whatever. But, you know, in, in an environment where, you know, you know, I at least think schools need to change, you know, to, um, to kill your innovators is a surefire recipe for irrelevance. Um, and unfortunately, we just have too many schools in which that environment persists. So as, as a follow-up, so I think kind of a, a two-part question. B building off the metaphor, um, what are some of the, the natural kind of fertilizers that we can use to kind of speed up and to grow the poppies at a similar rate? But the, also the other thing I'm thinking about, too, um, Nassim Taleb talks about, um, you know, the most – intolerant minority group and i think when you have negative school cultures it's not the majority of teachers right that it's a small group of individuals who are putting this pressure on those innovators and i'm wondering is there a way that how, how could we possibly kind of flip that culture where the the more intolerant minority group is the innovators who expect the best from everybody else does that, does that make sense that you know it's it how do we kind of like turn those tides where the pressure is being put almost from the innovators to keep up rather than those who are trying to inhibit. Yeah, no, I mean, that's awesome, right? So that's what we want. So um, Gloria Ladson Billings, she's a professor of educational leadership at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's this wonderful video that, of course, is locked down behind a paywall at Teachers College Press. But um, <laughs> it's this wonderful video where she talks about how you got the change people and the no change people. Right. And the change people are the ones that you could ask to come into school tomorrow with a paper bag on their head and be like, yeah, all right, I'll do that. <laughs> right? And then you've got the people on the other end. It doesn't matter what you're proposing to change. Like they're against it. Right. Like it doesn't matter. You know, it's not the thing itself. It's change is what they're against. But you have the vast majority in the middle that is, they're like at a tennis match. Right, and they're looking this way to see if the change people are going to win. They're looking this way to see if the no change people are going to win. They're going back and forth, right, watching to see who's going to ultimately win. And as she says, it's your job as the leader to make sure the change people win. So whatever it takes in terms of visibility, in terms of rewards, in terms of um, you know extra resources, in terms of they're the ones you respond to the quickest, you know whatever it takes, so that they are seen very visibly within the system as winning. Right. And simultaneously, without being jerky about it, you are not rewarding the no change people, right? In any way, shape, or form. You're you're not explicitly marginalizing them, but you sure aren't giving them attention or resources or energy as well. And the rest of the people can pretty quickly see which way the tide is moving here, right? And, and hopefully, and then most of them will start to move and start engaging behavior similar to the change people. So when I taught eighth grade, um, we had a group of very negative teachers in our school. And those of us who were less negative informally labeled them the dragons because they were not only cranky and, and breathed fire, right? But they were also powerful. Like they had power within the school. And I think what we have to do as, as teaching staffs, as school leaders, as innovators, is we have to figure out how to remove the power from the dragons. Right, so they can be as cranky and blow fire as much as they want, but that doesn't mean that they get to dominate and control and impact the rest of us who are moving forward. But that's that's leadership and that's school culture work. Thanks, Scott. Oh, I love that whole line of questions. Uh, so, speaking of innovation and change, because um, you mentioned a lot of it. Um, like the pedagogy and how our schools need to shift around. And in chapter five, you talk about the importance of creating an environment that fosters innovation, um, not just amongst teachers, but students uh, especially. Um, and you offer some examples of how that can look like later in your book as well. Uh, a few teachers in our district, especially here at the middle school, are considering making changes to the physical layouts of our room. Um, and adopting a more flexible seating model for our students. 
Uh, if you were tasked with designing a modern classroom for, for students today um, that reflects your big shifts, uh, what would you consider for the room? What would some of the priorities be when setting up and designing this modern classroom? Yeah, so I'm not a learning spaces guy like Bob Dylan or David Jakes or Christian Long, right? Um, but I would say that um, you want the environment to be as comfortable as possible and also allow for a variety of different learning and interaction modalities, right? So when I think about the way my kids do work at home, they're on the floor, they're curled up on a couch, they're in a bean bag, they're laying across the futon, they're, you know, straddled across the bed in some weird, uncomfortable position for us adults, you know, whatever, right? Like, you know, they're out on the back porch with their feet up, you know, like, how do we create different kinds of spaces within the school and within the classroom for a variety of different interaction modalities and learning modalities? So the kid who wants to, you know, lay on the floor and it be comfy while he types on his Chromebook, where do we allow that to happen, right? What about the three girls who want to go uh, sit on bean bags and work on a project together, right? Uh, what about the four kids who want to, you know, be at a standing desk uh, while they collaborate? I mean, like just a variety of sort of different things. Um, so it's not like there's one magic setup. It's really that you have a variety of micro setups within your space that can be used as the learning need arises or as, as the learning preference arises. One of the things I was noticing, because I've been doing, I've been trying to do a lot of research on the flexible seating, um, and most times when I see it, it looks like that is kind of taken in the elementary school model, and I think that reflects a lot of what you said, because there needs to be these many different micro setups, because that's what happens in elementary school. Um, do you think it's harder for people to adopt that? outside of that younger grade level when things are more like everything's set up like this is a history classroom this is an english classroom this is math i think it's harder to set up if you're not willing to also rethink your learning and teaching paradigm to go with it right i mean it's awfully hard to lecture to people in a variety of micro settings um and if that's your dominant modality then you want all your kids basically facing forward and listening to you perfect thank you so much um, can I can I add two ideas? Sorry. Um. So one I was thinking about. What did you say? Do it. Okay. So one. Um. Jonathan Werner, who's a library media specialist, has a really awesome title that I can't remember right now. Up in Maine, um, made this awesome comment a while ago. He said when he was thinking about learning space, he thought about Harry Potter and the Room of Requirements where the idea of the room of requirements is it would become whatever it was that you needed. And so when I've been around lots of different schools and then you know, talking to people that have explored space, I keep coming back to his concept and thinking, well, if I was to design a space so that the students could walk in and it could meet whatever requirement they had, what would that be? And then kind of tapping into this, and Scott, I'm gonna throw this one back. When it comes to that idea of, the pedagogy, and especially when you get into the middle and the upper school, with time to your shift about authenticity, can space be a reflection of like the discipline in the real world? So if we want students to be able to engage in a history class, if we want them to think like historians, would being able to create the space add to that authentic context if it allowed them to engage more in the practice of the historian? I mean, science is always sort of an easy one. Like there's a lab and you need to have equipment and stuff, um, you know, but what does a mathematician need? Or maybe is that a question? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. You know, when I think about your room of requirement concept that Jonathan articulates, I love that idea. I don't know if you can always create that much diversity within a single classroom, but you surely can within a school building. Right, you got lots of space to play with, uh, no matter how big or small your school is. Typically, um, the authentic work component is an interesting idea. Like we've sort of bought into that for electives, right? Like you get a different kind of space for physical education and art and music 
um, and science, right? But then when it comes to some of the other subjects, we don't, we would kind of like get these generic spaces, right? That are interchangeable. Um, and I think that would be a really interesting conversation to have with educators is about what would a room look like that was designed for the needs of mathematicians or historians, I think that's a, or writers. I think that's a great thing to explore. I'll also note that um, in, in some of these schools that are ramping up external internship opportunities, right? They're saying we want kids to have these authentic work environments and we're going to do that by actually sending kids into real work environments right so rather than trying to simulate them in our school you know you're going to do your graphic design and marketing work side by side with graphic design and marketing people at a graphic design and marketing firm right and you'll sit side by side with them in their space where they work every day and see what that feels like and looks like and you know um and and get that in your gut so it doesn't always have to be in the building itself, right? We can send them out to work. The work is being done as they get older. I'm going to follow up. So I love these um, pieces about talking about space, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot too and um, starting to read a little bit more about it and learn more about it, what we can do. And I certainly see the more flexible spaces and opportunities at the elementary, so I want to see that shift. Um, what I, I also am trying to think of, you know, how do we keep – integrating technology to kind of you know leverage opportunities sometimes you just can't you know get the kids out for whatever reason or how many logistics but so how can you leverage technology to bring the world or opportunities you know to them so um, as much as we are trying to do that um, I think that is certainly something that we're continuing to work on um, one thing in your in your book, you have a number of arguments that you added in the book. Um, one thing that kind of jumped out that might have been missing was the civic argument, um, especially with your inclusion of John Dewey. Um, I was wondering if you like considered this civic argument when writing the book, or um, how what we might want to rethink in schools to address civic literacy. And I know a piece of this is, you know, getting out and 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 participating or you know bringing in and engaging our, our, our students that way but I'm um, wondering kind of what you've been thinking about with that area uh, yeah so absolutely and I thought about it a lot um, I'm a former social studies teacher so I think about civic, <laughs> civic participation and you know what does it mean to be an engaged citizen and so on all the time um, I think the challenge is that unfortunately over the last several decades um, that has become a very politicized issue, right? So as you start talking about civic engagement, it very quickly turns into, oh yeah, who's civics? Oh yeah, who's politics? And so it's difficult to talk about civic engagement because all of a sudden these people start popping up that say that you're pushing a political agenda that shouldn't be in schools. And so the work can be done and we see many enterprising, energetic, enthusiastic, really smart social studies teachers around the country who are doing a great job of civic engagement work with students. But it's that's highly politicized these days. And you just have to tread very carefully and try to thread that fine balance. Because a lot of things that two or three decades ago we would say were not uh, of high alarm, right? Now, all of a sudden, you know, as students go out and engage in activities, um, the school system gets accused of pushing a political agenda. So even something as simple as voter registration or informing candidates about the issues, right? Well, the students, are, of course, are going to take one side or the other, at least occasionally, right? Um, and then they get accused of bias or the teacher or system gets accused of bias. Um, or again, registering voters is now a political issue. So, um, you know, I think it's just tough. So I just didn't want to dive into all that in the book, but I think about it a lot personally. Um, we talk about it a lot with schools. Thank you. If I can just follow up real quick here too, but when I think of the four big shifts, I, I don't know how you can escape entering into these, kind, like how you can escape entering into the civic domain, right? Can you, one of the problems that I feel like we have in the the civic sector right now is that we don't have a lot of deep thinking. Uh, it's some of the most uh, authentic types of learning to investigate because it has a direct impact on the students' lives. Um, technology is amplifying 
how students can send out their messaging, engage with others. And we're also seeing how the problems of, by not teaching students how to engage in productive dialogue, we've got the, the cesspool that is the, co the comment section. Um, and then, you know, giving students the agency to explore those topics. I just, it, it seems like the, the area of civics is, is right for the, the, the four big shifts, or at least that's it, it, almost like the low hanging fruit to a certain extent. I mean, I, I, could, I could be wrong on that, Scott, but that's just kind of my two cents there as, as a former history teacher myself. Yeah. Well, no, and I think you, know, you just think about a more abstract and but powerful concept like elevating student voice, right? Well, guess what? Kids have brains. They have opinions. They have thoughts. And so as, they, as we elevate their voice, they're going to start expressing their thoughts about things that may or may not jive with what the adults want them to talk about. You know, look at the teenagers down in Parkland, Florida, right? We got a lot of adults who wish those kids would just shut up. So, um, you know, but, you know, their voice is elevated and they're willing to use it. And so some of it is what's your comfort level in a school district with kids actually having real agency and real voice. And there's a whole lot of teachers and a whole lot of districts that aren't very comfortable with that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, Maureen mentioned that you, you quoted, um, you know, Weingartner Postman. And, you know, I think there's an excerpt in the book that talks about, you know, once you get a, a person thinking, there's no telling where their mind's going to end up, right? So, you, you know, it's harder to control those objectives, particularly for content uh, standards. But I think the other challenge to this, and I'll, I'll end on this point, is that, you know, we, and I, I'm guilty as anybody, but we, we bemoan the lack of civic participation, yet, you know, the space where we could foster it um, we don't take advantage of it, and then we wonder why people are, are civically disengaged. So I think we're, we're, we may be cutting off our nose, spread our face a little bit here. Oh, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the books that's been really influential to me as I think about this is, is an older book from Diane Ravitch, because she's a historian, mm -hmm. uh, called The Language Police, where she talks about how censorship from both sides makes the kind of instructional materials we give our students really bland and boring. Because anything that might be interesting, guess what, is also a little controversial. And so, you know, somebody objects to this from this side, somebody objects to that from that side, and the stuff we have left is like this bland pablum that we feed our students and then we wonder why they're not interested in it. It's because, again, any sort of controversial issue or something worth engaging in intellectually or, you know, really diving in and wrestling with has been removed by outside pressure groups. So from our entire curriculum, it's not just the textbooks, but everything else. And I think that's the challenge. Thanks, Scott. Can I just follow up with that real quick? Sorry. Uh, so, because that's something that that I say a lot. That that, um, how do you address and deal with those really challenging and I, I guess ideas that can be challenged? I, how, I'm warning this so poorly. <laughs> As an educator, you want kids to be engaged. You want to. Uh, present them different ideas and uh, things that might oppose uh, their own viewpoints and the viewpoints of others to to engage them and think at such a critical level. Is is there a certain age that that type of conversation is better for than others? Like, is at what point do we start allowing our kids to really observe the world around them and the challenges that exist and the things that affect their lives that might be seen as too controversial? So I think there's lots of ways to have kids think critically about challenging life issues and societal challenges, even in early elementary, right? You just make it age appropriate and design accordingly and so on. But, you know, again, we have to realize, I think, two things. One is that administrators are notoriously controversy averse. So if you're doing anything, as soon as somebody starts complaining about it out in the community, right, the instinctive reaction by the administrator or the school board is to shut it down. Um, and, you know, so there seems to be a general lack of bravery or commitment to standing up for 
some of uh, these richer dialogues that are po only possible uh, if we're willing to give kids authentic agency and authentic voice. But that controversy aversion from the board, from the principal, from the superintendent, whatever, works deeply against that, right? And of course, the second thing, what you mentioned earlier, is we have a whole lot of adults who really don't want kids to have voice at all. They just want there to sit there. They want them to sit there and be compliant and do what they're told, right? And you can earn the right to have your voice later when you're an adult. Um, and that's not a mindset I buy into, but it's a prevalent one. Thank you. So I'm thinking, OK. I have a question that was written down, but my brain's going in for a different question for a second. Um, so one of the things that, the question I wrote, wrote I'm gonna start with the one that's written down because it's way more articulate than my brain right now. So with these four big shifts, with this idea of student agency and voice and authentic context, um, how do we help educators understand that these four shifts are not just silos, but they're interrelated components? And with that idea, I'm coming back to, a previous protocol when you were talking also about the idea of a domain of knowledge and how do we build sort of that knowledge or the language of the domain of knowledge. And so how do we see those things? How do we help people see all of that as interrelated, both the four big shifts, the domain of knowledge. So it's not the, well, I have to focus on my content standards. I'll get to deeper learning later. Oh, wait, I have my voice and choice hour. Um, how do we help people see them all together? Right. So we have a, a protocol that goes along with the four big shifts. We call it, you know, creatively the four shifts protocol. Um, and the idea is that it has a variety of questions that you can ask about your work and redesign lessons and so on. What I have found working with educators uh, with the protocol is that when you take a lesson or a unit or instructional activity and you start redesigning it, even as you start focusing on one part of the protocol, say the deeper learning section, right, is that other shifts come along, you know, along the way. And so unintentionally, you know, all of a sudden, oh, look, we gave kids some more agency there. Look, look at that. We can go down and look at this question. And oh, look, now we can answer that one students instead of teacher, for example. So I found that um, having a lot of great productive conversations with the protocol. Um, and we're helping people through that work as they brainstorm and generate ideas about how learning can be different perhaps in, in one domain and other stuff starts to come along. We can also create um, targeted challenges or asks or requests or plant ideas where you say, while you're doing this, I wonder if you also could pull this in, right? Um, and that seems to work pretty well too. So. Um, yeah, that's been a very effective vehicle for us, um, is to just help people see something that's robust and dissect it and say, look how it has this component, and this component, and this component across these domains. But to also simply start with one domain and then see what comes along as we go. Are, are there any danger points? Like if people start in one spot versus the other, can they not get to where they're seeing those connections? So like if I just start by thinking about um, the technology piece, or if I just start by thinking maybe about student agency, but not the deeper learning, can I essentially go down a path, but without really hitting to the complexity that we're hoping students can get to? Uh, yes, you can. And I think we see that happening. Um, is that schools will uh, hit the proverbial wall, right? So we got all these computers in the room and student engagement went up for a little while, but now it's kind of flat again. Well, because you didn't change anything else, right? Um, and so it's still um, kind of the same old boring classroom it was, but now you spend a bunch of money on it. Um, or we're giving kids agency, quote, unquote, but it's not real meaningful agency. It's like uh, we're still doing low-level learning work, right? So yes, you can pick which worksheet you want to work on. That's technically greater agency, but it's not very inspiring. Right, so it's only when we start to couple these things in richer, deeper ways, um, and really focus on meaningful, deeper, authentic uh, areas that you know we start to see the fruition there. But it's very possible to take a small slice of this and say you're doing it without really seeing the overall benefits. Uh, I like how you just talked a little bit about like shifting um, how we do things. Uh, in the classroom. Uh, your co-author, Dean Tresky, 
uh, said in the book, school is no longer constrained by how far the bus can travel in the morning. And the schools will be the last to take notice. Um, I appreciate how the learning argument reframed the role of the teacher from an instructor uh, to a learning designer, because um, it might help teachers to reconceptualize both their practice and how they view their identity um, in the classroom. Uh, what advice do you have um, for helping teachers in making these big shifts? Um. One piece of advice would be to recognize that many students, if not most students, are experiencing, are often experiencing more powerful forms of learning and different kinds of learning modalities at home than they are at school. And they're coming to your class with the attitude and the basic expectation and a very rational question of, what do you got? Right? And this is not the like, um, the false entertainment versus substance, you know, straw man that they like to throw up there. Well, I don't wanna just get up there and dance in front of my kids, right, and entertain them. That's not what we're talking about. What they're saying is that at home, you know, they get to be different and powerful learners in ways that they don't experience in your classroom. And then when they show up every day and see that they don't get to learn that way, then they rightfully start to question or disengage or opt out or whatever, right? So I think that's the first thing, is to recognize that kids have different learning opportunities these days outside of school, which means that they come to your class with different expectations or very rational questions about why they can't learn in those ways in their formal learning institutions. Um, second piece of advice is just is um, don't be your own blocker, right? Like we see so many teachers talk themselves out of being risk takers, and you know, number of reasons I've heard from teachers why they can't do something, you know, is almost endless. And I think if you talk to administrators or whoever the ambiguous they is that the teachers say you know are responsible for why they can't do something. Most of the time, those people are like, what? No, go for it, right? And so um, we have to own our own um, fears, our own control needs, our own um, inertia, our own pedagogical inertia, our own yes buts. Like we have to own those ourselves and recognize that no matter how like constraining your school system is on the outside and how you know mandate oriented whatever your principal is, whatever, there's still a ton you can do in your classroom. Um, that would be awesome and amazing. Um, and just don't hold yourself back. Um, you know, and, and I guess there's a third part they don't often say because people don't like to hear it, but, um, you know, but I'll say it here. If your third grader is a more powerful learner than you are as a veteran teacher, you should be embarrassed. I like that a lot. Uh, part of the, I do agree that kids learn so powerfully at home. A large component of that is because though that's, stuff that they're really interested in so they seek that out um so uh what i hear a lot from teachers is well they're just not interested in this so how do you contend with that argument that people just say well they can't have this powerful learning here because this student's just not interested in my subjects right so of course there are teachers of that subject whom kids love and there are teachers of that subject who don't have that problem, their kids are actually very interested in the subject, right? So is it the subject itself, or is it how you're teaching it in that context with your kids, right? And it's always the latter, right? You know, like I love hearing teachers tell me, oh, well, they can do that kind of work in some other discipline, but not mine, right? And I'm like, well, what about those 500 people over there who are in your discipline who are doing that awesome work, right? Like they seem to figure out how to make it work in your discipline. So, you know, you know, we come up again, we come up with reasons why we can't do stuff that don't hold up very well under closer examination. Um, so I think we have to be able to critically interrogate our own belief systems. We have to critically interrogate our own instructional practice. We have to understand that yes sometimes there are certain content items or procedural skills that we need kids to acquire but that doesn't mean we can't give them agency and choice and go in deeper learning directions in other aspects 
right? And if you do that, their kids are more willing to go along with these, more sort of bitter pills to swallow or whatever. Right? Like there's so many different approaches to all this, and but I think we have to call people on it. I don't think we just let them get a get away with saying that stuff and then be like, yeah, all right, yeah, sure, you're right, right? Because it's not true. Because we have just too many examples elsewhere of people teaching your subject with the same level of kids and the same kind of kids and the same kind of whatever constraints you come up with that are doing it differently, right? And I just don't think it holds water. And I think um, a piece too is you have to create that culture. So um, of kind of calling people out. And I think in the past we really were in silos. I mean, I know it still exists now, but we really did not collaborate across you know, our disciplines or open our doors. And um, I, there are a lot of structures in place in the last decade that we're moving in the right direction. And, um, you know, I've been in different systems. So when you refer to some and you say, oh, this is like, I've seen this kind of culture. I'm like, yep, I've been there. I live that. And then you're in another one and you might have leadership saying, okay, it's okay to fail. Um, so I, I definitely, a lot of what you just said really resonates. I also have a sixth grader and, and, and uh, Dave sent me a little message because everything is resonating with me for him. Um, he built a trebuchet on his own this weekend just because it seemed interesting. And um, so he did that and he often says, um, like, why do I need to go to school? Like, he's compliant. He'll do it. Why do I need to go when I can learn everything I can on my own? And obviously, he can't learn everything on his own, but uh, there's that piece, and it's always in my head. So um, it, it can be tricky, um, but I, I think uh, you're definitely hitting on some key points. Um, a big part of my – oh, did you want to respond? Yeah. Yeah, can I? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, so first of all, I love that he feels he can learn anything he wants on his own. Like, that is awesome. Yeah. Right, like talk about an empowered learner. What do you mean I can't learn something? Of course I can, um, right? But I think, you know, we also have to get beyond this idea of leaders simply giving permission, because I hear that a lot from principals. Well, they have permission to do whatever, right? That's not enough. You have to create active expectation structures, active dialogue structures, active learning structures that actually foster and promote. Right? Like, it's not just enough to get out of their way. You also have to get behind and, and create structures that drive it. Um, and so I think that's part of it as well. Um, you know, and I guess the other thing I was thinking um, as we were talking here is, like, when we think about these dialogue structures and and expectation structures you know like I was in this awesome um, second grade classroom last week where students were doing presentations and the other students in the room were incredibly attentive listeners and then they gave them awesome feedback but part of the feedback was they were saying things like you know I'm going to give you a presentation a two minus and here's why right and then they articulated very clearly and articulately where the deficiencies were in the presentation and some areas of growth were for their fellow seven-year-olds, right? I just kept thinking in my head, when's the last time a teacher told another teacher, yeah, I think that was a two minus, right? And here's why. Like, we just don't have those kind of conversations with each other, and we desperately need to. That's a great point. Um, and one part of my role, uh, we have, you know, obviously in charge of professional development. Um, in a couple of months, we're hosting the Inspired Learning Convention, which is a face-to-face -face meetup to share lessons units that align at least in part with your four big shifts. Um, we recognize, thank you for that, <laughs> we recognize that it's challenging to implement the ideas that you haven't seen or to try something where you don't know where to start. Um, so our events and attempt to share the, these kind of practices from all of your work coordinating PD throughout the country. What advice would you give us to help share and support our fellow educators? So the event empowers teachers to make changes and you know, take away and bring it right back to their classrooms. Um, continue to send strong messages of support. Continue to send strong messages of resourcing. Um, and then give them at the event itself lots of opportunities to not only see and hear from their peers, but also dialogue, think, make sense about it, actually do some planning of their own of how they could start incorporating some of that while they have that person with them to give them suggestions and ideas. Um, you know, strategies and techniques and so on. So, you know, you don't want it to be a conference where you go and sit and listen to somebody awesome for 50 minutes and then you walk away and go to another one. You want it to be an opportunity where you sit and listen to somebody awesome 
but then you also have meaning making time and dialoguing time and action planning time and whatever that helps them get closer to doing it themselves. Awesome. Thank you. So, uh, Scott, we're coming right up against the end of our time together. We did get one audience question that I think is pretty interesting. Uh, Jen, who is a math teacher from Rhode Island, asked, um, you know, what are colleges and universities doing to uh, encourage their pre-service teachers to be ready for different schools for a different world? So, you know, is it kind of translating a little bit? I know you focus mostly on ed leadership, but, you know, is there anything that higher ed can be doing to help hit the ground running when they get into these contexts? So the answer to your last question is yes, of course. Um, the longer answer is, uh, as somebody who's been a professor for a long time, I always tell people that if you think your K-12 system is moving slow, come to higher ed. Um, and unfortunately, um, our teacher preparation programs, most of them, maybe all of them, since I have yet to find one, um, are further behind actually than the K-12 schools are. So um, that's partly because um, of the way higher ed is structured in our reward systems and, and how we hire people mostly for their research skills, not their teaching and service um, skills. But it's also because existing faculty don't have the skill sets to do this work, right? Like if you went around and tried to find significant numbers of teacher education faculty who knew how to do uh, project and crew based learning, for example, or had knew how to do rich technology infusion in their subject area, right? Um, most of them would really flounder, right? And, and yet, unlike K-12 schools, because they have K-12 schools of teachers like that, right? They have very weak professional learning structures. So K-12 school, who has teachers who would, who would fit the description, we have mechanisms in place in those schools to at least attempt to get people with the skills and moving forward. But in higher ed, we have, at best, um, maybe a teaching center across campus that you could stroll and ask a few questions of, or uh, a few voluntary, non-required um, activities that that center puts on where you could maybe boost a few skills. And I don't know, we're just way, way behind in terms of professional learning structures and expectations, which means that um, our people don't have the skill sets to change and adapt as, as they need to. Well, Scott, um, you know, I think uh, coming from higher ed, you know, I was fortunate to work with some people, Renee Hobbs and Julie Coiro, namely, who um, do do that. I think the, the Summer Institute in Digital Literacy, which you really enjoy at URI, um, helped to kind of make those shifts and put an inquiry-oriented learning into practice. Um, but you're absolutely right that we need to do a better job um, on both ends, get, getting students to the point where they could enter into the schools that have made the big shifts, but also creating those conditions where you've got some really ambitious young educators who want to try things who are, who are growing poppies, don't get cut off, you know, right at the beginning. Um, so again, Scott, th thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, you know, we really enjoyed the book, but we're also curious about, you know, what, what can we look for on the horizon from you? Uh, and I also hear a rumor that you're heading to our neck of the woods shortly. Yes. So I was quickly looking up the uh, leaders of the Summer Institute to see if they were tenure line faculty or non tenure line. They faculty. are. Okay. So that's even even greater rarity. So that's awesome. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Back to the question. Um, what am I up to? So we have another book coming out from Solution Tree. Um, different schools for different world was really a big picture book. It was meant to frame the entire series of books. Um, and it was supposed to be the one big picture book in the series that kind of outlined where schools need to go. And then all the other books in this series are meant to be more practical and hands-on. Uh, my next book, which hopefully will come out this summer or maybe late summer, early fall, um, is really, okay, how do you take these shifts and really translate them into day-to-day -day practice in the classroom? And it's really just an awesome lesson redesign book where we take the protocol that I mentioned earlier, 
We introduce you to it. We tell you how it's different from some other frameworks like SAMR and TPAC. Um, and then in the book, we redesign something like eight or nine lessons as examples, and then close with strategies and techniques for how to do this and use it well yourself. Um, so I know you all have been doing that work as a district. The book is sort of meant to capture some of that in book form. Um, so that's coming up. Here in Colorado, I'm on a quest to try and identify all those project inquiry-based learning schools across the state and start to network them together to create a critical mass. So um, I'm in the process of creating a Colorado Innovates website where we will tell their stories with photos and videos and project examples and descriptions of the school. I want to do an annual Colorado Innovates meetup where they come together and share what they're doing with each other because right now they're mostly isolated and disconnected from each other and really start to create, like I said, this critical mass of schools, but also conversation about what learning and teaching could look like instead. Right, and I need to have some place to point administrators and parents and policymakers to, right, to help them envision what it could be instead. And be like, look, look at what your kid does. Now read these three blog posts about these three, you know, schools. Which one do you want for your kid? Right, exactly. Let's make that happen. So um, that's kind of where I'm heading um, in terms of my own work. Um, there is an event coming up in Vermont in April. Um, you can reach it through the EdTech Teacher um, website. Um, I forget what the exact title of it is, some kind of innovation institute. Um, and I will be there keynoting um, and working with school leaders there in early April. So I'm excited about that. Well, Scott, thank you again for your time. Once you uh, wrangle up all of those project-based inquiry uh, and authentic learning schools in Colorado, please make sure you connect them with us in Massachusetts in the Inspired Learning Project and the Inspired Learning Convention. So that way we can you know, spread across state lines because I think we we have a, a shared value system um and the more we share the better the experience for all our students yeah um, so i should add one more thing i'm also keynoting the massachusetts superintendent summer institute in mashpee in july all right. in july so uh I'll be there for that so looking right. forward to that awesome so i'll be there as well awesome all right spend some time in new england um so again scott thank you for your time our next interview will take place on april 5th as susie boss the author of All Together Now, How to Engage Your Stakeholders in Reimagining School will be our guest. We'll be live at 7. Uh, thank you again to our panelists, Beth, Maureen, Jimmy. Really appreciate your time. Um, for MURSD Leads in the Menden Upton Regional School District, I'm Dave Quinn. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.